from New York University Stern School of Business. I'm Jane and today we are joined by Professor Alison Taylor. Welcome Professor Taylor. Thank you so much for having me Jane. So Prof Taylor, you don't sound like a New Yorker. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, your background and how you came to be where you are? Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in London, you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. I'm not a New Yorker, uh, but really, I think partly because we didn't have any money when I was a kid and we never got to go anywhere, I was always desperate to travel. So I have spent most of my, I certainly spent most of my 30s and quite a lot of my 20s living on planes. Oh, so nice. I really wanted to see the world. I really wanted to go and look at what was going on out there. And that's always been, I've always been kind of restless. So mm -hmm. I came to the US originally to go to grad school. Uh, I did a master's at the University of Chicago oh. in the late 90s. And then I went back to uh, London for about 10 years. So mm. I lived in Dubai for a little while in mm. there and I uh, was traveling a lot in Africa. And then I moved to New York originally for work mm. in 2011. Uh, since then, I've got married, I've changed jobs twice, I've bought a house, I've become an American citizen. So uh, as we were just saying, I think, uh, I think New York's a good place for me. I think the culture, and the people and the opportunities are a good fit for my personality. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good description. <laughs> New Yorkers usually have that uh, sense that the city just matches their personality or their energy level. Um, so that's great. In terms of what brought you here, um, so obviously you, you've lived in London, Dubai and New York. How would you describe those three and what do you like out of each of those three cities? Well, London's my home. Uh, I would go to London for certain sorts of food. I don't eat Lon uh, Indian food in London. I think the theatre's really good. Um, I think you can still have a really good night out in London. Obviously, the museums, the parks, the history. It's very beautiful. Um, sort of city. I like the way that it's villagey and so you can live quite centrally and feel like you're in a little community. Mm. Um, downsides, the weather, the economy, the attitude. I find it quite a claustrophobic country. Mm. I think um, there's still a really big focus on the class system, which I think mm. um, is not very dynamic and not very good for the country. Um, Dubai was really, really interesting professionally. At the time, I was working in corporate investigations, so I was investigating kind of fraud and corruption and money laundering and terrorist financing, and lots of hot money goes through Dubai, as you probably know, lots of criminals there. Um, I didn't like the lifestyle so much. I'm bored by going to malls and sitting by the mm. pool and all that kind of thing. Mm. So um, I, uh, I didn't like that about it, but then you can get to uh, Kenya in three hours, you can get to India in three hours so it's a good place to be um, as a destination to go to other places from that's for, for sure um, and then New York I just um, I love the dynamism I love the people um, uh, London's very similar in that there are people from everywhere and you hear all these different languages on the subway and I like that melting pot aspect. Mm. Um, I've been able to change careers, as I already said, a couple of times here. I feel there's a lot of opportunity. Mm. I feel it's really entrepreneurial. I feel it's really creative. One thing I think is that very often as you get older, it's quite hard to make new female friends, for example. I've made great female friends here. I like New York mm. women. Mm. Uh, obviously, I met my husband here. so. Mm. Um, all of those things are, are kind of great. Maybe that's uh, the stuff everybody knows about New York. I mean, maybe the things that people uh, know less about New York is you can go even an hour north up the Hudson and you are in wild rural America with <laughs> coyotes and bears and yeah. giant eagles and deer running around. Um, and so I have a house about two hours north of the city in, in Woodstock, oh. New York. Um, and so that's pretty amazing to have the combination of this huge city and then really remote countryside with a bear wandering in your garden mm -hmm. is pretty cool. Yeah, amazing. So you've worked as a consultant as well. What led you to academia? Oh, um, I mean, I think I, I, I went in, I took lots of different sorts of consulting roles. So I worked in kind of country risk and market entry, mm -hmm. and then I worked in kind of corporate investigations and ethics and compliance mm -hmm. kind of work. Um, I've done consulting work on culture, and then obviously now uh, sustainability and ESG. And I really, really um, enjoyed all those roles. 
Uh, I started once I got middle age to ask kind of bigger questions about what I was really good at and how I would have the most impact and where I um, really kind of wanted to spend the rest of my career. So it was quite late in life I moved into academia. I decided I, I didn't want an office job anymore. I didn't want the sales pressure and that I wanted to be in a role where I could think about ideas and where I could uh, maybe use what I'd learned to kind of inspire the next generation. I mean, um, I am sure I learn more than the students in the classroom. I get such a kick out of teaching here. Mm. The students are so brilliant, so practical, such a wide range of experience. And so I kind of think if I can help the next generation of leaders leverage their skills and think about stuff in a new way, mm. and I can accept my own limitations as a, as a, as a consultant, but I can maybe uh, give other people the ideas and tools um, to shape their careers, I think that's a good way for me. I've decided that's a good way for me to have impact at this stage in my life. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing I would say is I'm not, you know, I'm not an academic, obviously. I spent my whole career as a practitioner. Mm. So that's my currency in the classroom. I think mm. students students like me if they like me because I've got a lot of anecdotes, I've got a lot of practical experience, I'm just sat in a university giving my opinion. Mm. Um, and so it's really, really important for me if I'm going to carry on teaching that I'm also engaging in the real world. I'm also still doing consulting work, advisory work, talking to companies, seeing what's out there. I don't want to end up standing in the classroom talking about something that was true five years ago. So mm. I only want to be in academia if I can also be in the real world as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. And that's the exact point that really resonated with me. In, in fact, that you did have the experience and now you're actually talking and teaching us about it because it was your life for a lot, very long time. Yeah, mm. and I think it's easy enough to study these things and think it's simple. Mm. It's a really different thing to be in an organization dealing yeah. with power and culture and leadership and you've got to get on and you've got to get promoted and what do you say yes to and what do you say no to mm. and everything's messy, we're all making decisions on the fly. So I can sit and teach you this perfect framework and this perfect decision making tool, yeah. but that's not what real life's like. Yeah. So um, I think it's really important to bring that into the classroom discussion and not just kind of sit there on a pedestal yeah. lecturing. Yeah, what I really liked what uh, about the very first class was that you mentioned that we still don't know how it's going to look like and it's still going to change so it's not a, a really granular thing right exactly and it's mm. a really dynamic space and mm. I like to teach I mean it's partly the topics I teach mm. I teach sustainability and ESG and ethics and they're all really evolving fast mm. but also, when I was in grad school and I've done a couple of graduate degrees, I'd mm. sit in classes and professors would be like, here's a book and yeah. here's the way it is. And I'd yeah. be like, well, it's not the way it is because yeah. the world's out there changing. And yeah. so some students, I'm sure, find it irritating that I don't give certainty, you know, but I, <laughs> I, I want to make real. it clear, yeah. right, with the topics we're talking about, mm. the people in the class um, that you're in, you know, you're going to be shaping the future of this field. So mm. I'm not going to tell you it's set if it mm. isn't. Mm. Like, I want to give mm. you the ideas. I'm not going to tell you what to think. You can decide for yourself what you think's relevant, what you think's valid. You're all incredibly smart people. Mm. It's not up to me to tell you the answers. It's up to me I think to give you the concepts and the frameworks and then you can look out there and apply them to your own life and see what's useful and what isn't. Yeah, perfect. So the subject that you are teaching is currently called How to Drive Competitive Advantage Through Sustainability. If you had to um, describe sustainability in one word or in one sentence, what would that be? I think it's about... Um, thinking about um, the fact that we exist on a planet with finite resources, so not assuming that you can grow endlessly um, in a vacuum. And then I think it's also about thinking about the generations that come after you. It's about thinking about how we can have a society and environment that we're just not depleting resources and thinking about what's good for us, but we are thinking about the wider context, the wider social and environmental systems that we operate in. Mm. And I think uh, if you think about 
that idea that has a lot of incredibly profound challenges to how we've traditionally run and thought about businesses. So mm. I think it's it's a philosophical challenge to what mm. we're thinking about. It's also a really practical challenge because everything from planning to strategy to accounting is not necessarily taking account of these things, yet we can all see out there very powerful forces in society driving us to think about these things. It's very, very clear to me younger people care about this stuff, they have very different values, but then we're in a system still that prioritizes other things. So I like how complicated and messy it is as a topic. <laughs> Yeah. So you mentioned before <clears throat> the practical area of it as well. So we are currently moving from a shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. How practicable is it and how realistic is it? Or would sustainability will still come at a cost to shareholders? Um, I think the jury is out really on, on whether this is a cost or whether this is a benefit. Mm -hmm. There is evidence that if you focus strategically mm -hmm. on issues that are relevant to the business, relevant to risk, relevant to impact, relevant to the bottom line, mm -hmm. and you manage those issues well, it will be good for shareholder value um, over the long term. I think it's very often you'll see a debate you know, in the media, is it better to have shareholder value or think about stakeholders? It's not as simple as that. It's not as binary as that. You know, even if you're just a real Milton Friedman advocate and you really only fit believe mm. in shareholder value, mm. you've still got to take, pay attention to shifting consumer demand, the fact that your employees believe in this stuff, mm. the fact that the world's much more transparent and you maybe can't keep your secrets or hide your unethical behavior anymore. So I think every business is going to be forced to adapt to these dynamics, whether or you don't have to believe in sustainability to shape these challenges. Mm. So um, it's another reason it's so complicated and interesting. It's partly a story of risk. It's partly a story of value. It's partly a story of ethics and impact. And yeah. so I think a smart approach thinks in a very careful way about what the difference is between these elements and also understands that maybe it's not such a good idea maybe to expect business to save the world but it's perfectly valid to think that businesses should be making their own companies better mm. and more sustainable. So mm. I'm not looking for businesses to, to save the planet, but I am looking for businesses to make their own companies better, to reduce the harms, to make a good faith effort to deal with their externalities, to try to treat their employees with dignity and respect. Um, and I think that's important for its own sake. And I also believe it will correlate with sh uh, long term shareholder value. Yeah. Excellent. So not too long ago, you um, shared the, uh, an event by Sirius Global and they hosted an annual event where uh, a lot of thought leaders from the ESG space um, shared their insights and perspectives. What do you think the future of sustainability looks like over the next three to five years? Well, there's a lot of debate about, at the moment, journalists keep calling me up and saying, is ESG a fad and will it go away? And I always say, well, no, it isn't because the, the wider kind of mega trends are absolutely not going away. We're very, very aware, much more aware as a society of climate change, inequality, um, and, and, and all the things I've kind of talked about. So, so there's no uh, possibility for me that this is a fad or it's just mm. going to kind of disappear. Mm. I do think there are problems with the concept of ESG when we've been obviously talking about this. So mm. maybe where we'll be in five years is, is we won't use the term as much. I think we'll probably see more differentiated mm. investor strategies yeah. because sometimes environmental and social issues align and sometimes they play off against each other. If you mm. close a factory, you'll reduce your carbon footprint you'll also put thousands of people out of work mm. so I think we're now kind of in an era where we're a bit less kind of making arguments that this is all easy and it's all a win-win and starting to think about what the trade-offs might be I think you've got to make really uncomfortable trade-offs uncomfortable calls have some courage as a leader understand you can't be everything to everyone so what I'm hoping is all the noise aside especially in the US we're moving to a more serious and structured conversation yeah Okay. Um, on a lighter note, you have a mini xylophone that you take to class yes. every day. Do you yes. have a story with that? 
Oh, I got given it. Um, I did a master's, an executive master's myself in organizational psychology. Um, and the professors used it there and then they gave us each one. Um, and I don't actually need it that much in the class I have with you, but it's better than clapping and yelling when people yeah. are in the middle of a conversation. It really cuts through the noise. Yeah. Um, so that's why I use it. It's just a kind of, and then people always think it's funny. So that's another reason, especially yeah. when I'm in the first, second class and people don't know who I am and they're like, oh, who's this person? Um, I like to just kind of mess around a bit and make people feel comfortable if I can. Nice. Yeah, it's, it's very cute. It has a soothing voice, rather. Yeah. A soothing noise. Okay. Um, so, currently, you are um, planning a women's leadership event in September. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah. It's going to be great. So, um, I have this really good friend, Claire Gustafsson. Um, she is, uh, she's just amazing. She's got, uh, she's very, very charismatic. She was a, a, a very successful opera singer. She's the best dancer I've ever seen. She's an amazing baker. I'll send you her Instagram page. But she's also um, an impact and leadership coach. She's done amazing things like go to Saudi Arabia and teach women how to have leadership presence in obviously a difficult country for women. Um, and she's a gestalt psychotherapist. So another thing I, I kind of really like about her, she can do cult coaching, but if you need therapy as well, she can do that. So she does a lot of work on leadership presence and owning your space and kind of being confident and managing stress. Um, I obviously do a lot of work on sustainability and ESG and leadership from that perspective. I also do a lot of work thinking about ethics and culture and group dynamics and leadership. So we're going to try and bring it all together. We're going to get a, a, a group of women together um, upstate in the Hudson Valley. It's very good timing for Climate Week where people come mm. here a lot. Mm. Um, and we're going to have a, a really good time, I think, running workshops. We're going to do a lot of kind of physical work a lot of group work um, and hopefully start to build a new community. So I'm super excited about working with her because she's a really good friend mm. um, and uh, and she's a pretty amazing person. I'm partly coming so I can take her her part of the class as well. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to sit in the audience and be one of the students. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. What do you think the current challenges for uh, women in New York would be or women in, in the States? Well, um, the most obvious one is that um, there's no maternity leave. It's one of about three countries in the world with no maternity leave. You have to take sick leave to have a baby. Um, I think the childcare isn't very good. Um, I think the schools aren't very good. So there's a bunch of, of, of stuff, I think, that just makes life really hard if you want to have um, children. Yeah. Um, there's then a bunch of stuff that I think is probably true of women leaders in general, right? Mm. You can't win, you know? You're too aggressive or you're too timid, you're too old or you're too young, mm. you're too loud or you're too quiet. Mm. You kind of, mm. you know, there's a lot of people mm in organizations making assumptions, projecting their assumptions onto you. Um, and I think this is genuinely difficult to kind of manage. And so um, as I get older, um, I think I'm a little bit better at owning my space, a little bit better at pushing back on stuff. Something I hear a lot in the classroom or when I say this, it seems to always really resonate with the women in the room. I still hear women in the office getting a lot of soft pressure to do what I would call office housework, like running the intern offsite, you know, managing the recruitment process, doing yeah. the internal training, yeah. doing stuff that's essential. The business couldn't run without it, yeah. but isn't necessarily promotable. Yes. So, and I do not see men being, and I think mm. people of color, this happens as well, especially mm. with diversity initiatives. Mm. I do not see men being soft pressured in the same way. Yeah. So I think a lot of it is about owning your space and pushing back on that stuff. And that is super, super difficult. Mm. Um, something that gives me a lot of cause for optimism, though, I, the young men I see in the classroom, I think are very, very different from my generation. Mm. I do think that culture is shifting. Mm. I do uh, read a lot of papers, for example, from young men who care deeply about supporting their female colleagues and colleagues of color. Mm. So um, I do think things are better. I'm very inspired by the young women I see in the classroom, but I sure still wouldn't say it's easy. And mm. I think a lot of it's not the kind of very obvious stuff, as I just said, it's the soft 
stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I have in every role I've had been kind of pressured to do the office housework and mm. not to have a sales role, not mm. to have a public facing role, mm. not to do the kind of demanding things like that, but really, you know, just stay and train the interns. Mm. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> Professor Taylor, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Before we wrap up, I thought I've prepared a few questions for a quick fire round. Would you be sure. up for that? Of course. Okay, great. So we have two minutes to answer these questions. Okay. Ready? What's your favorite drink? Oh, mezcal. Ooh, okay. What do you do for you? Uh, I do an hour of yoga every morning and I will not be interrupted. Well, I do two things. First thing is I have to wake up really slowly and I have to drink coffee in bed and read the papers and I, nothing <laughs> is happening quickly and I'd rather wake up earlier so I can do that and then I do yoga in the morning um, and that really calms me down and is really good for my mental health and means I, no matter what, I've got an hour, I'm not on my phone, yeah. I'm not dealing with my family, yeah. I'm not dealing with my job and I I think that's to the extent I'm saying that's why. <laughs> <laughs> okay, nice. Um, I was going to say what gets you up in the morning, so but I okay, just answer yeah. that. Okay. Um, if you have a choice between establishing a new colony in Mars versus saving the Earth, what would you choose? Saving the Earth. <laughs> okay, that's easy. What's your power song? Oh, oh God, that's such a good question. I don't know. I have to think about it. I have to think about it. Okay, I'll come back to that later. Come back to it. Why do you do what you do? Um, because I um, I am really inspired by what I do. The idea of getting bored by what I do is crazy. I could teach the same class 20 times and it will be a completely different experience every time because it will be a different group of people, different reactions, different personalities, a different group dynamic. Stuff will be happening in the real world that we can talk about in real time. Mm. This is something I could do for the rest of my life and never get bored. Mm. Lovely. Okay. Um, and what do you want to be remembered for? Um... I hope um, being inspiring and supportive and maybe making a difference to um, people's lives and careers. Perfect. I, I, I would hope that um, people will um, find that I've given them ideas or inspiration to maybe take some risks, take their um, work in a different direction, maybe do something they weren't thinking of before. Um, and then I suppose to be a good uh, family member, a good partner, um, and a good member of the community. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. And your power song? Back to my power song. I mean, I, I, what's popping into my head is You're So Vain by Carly Simon, ah. but I know because it's just such a kind of, yeah, yeah, song, but something like that, I Will Survive, something like that. <laughs> okay, lovely. <laughs> Some kind of women power ballad. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, Professor Taylor, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate studying, for you, uh, studying from you. Thank you so much, Jane, for having me. Thank you. So if you like our conversation, please press the like button, comment and share with your friends. In the meantime, don't forget to press the subscribe button so that the next video will go straight to your box. See you next time.